afternoon all. It's a very cold and windy day today. The Great Hastings Congress approaches for those that like playing towards the end of the year and into the start of January. Let's go back in time in this video to the Great Hastings Tournament of 1934-35. So December 34 it started and ending in January. The Great Hastings Tournament featured a number of the greatest players in the world around this time. Often they ended up being World Championship candidates. The Great Avro Tournament of 1939 was one of the greatest tournaments before the start of World War II. And many of the winners of Hastings were candidates in the Avro Tournament. For example, Salo Floor, uh, Max Erva, Ruben Fine, Samuel Rizewski, they, they had all done very well at Hastings. There was one Hastings where there was a rude awakening. Two of the great superstars faced some difficulties against George Allen Thomas, a British player. George Allen Thomas was also a great expert in other games. He was a British badminton, tennis and chess player. He was twice British chess champion and a 21-time All England badminton champion. He also played in the semi-finals of the men's tennis doubles at Wimbledon in 1911. So competitive rivalry was nothing new uh, to Sir George Allen Thomas. And in fact, Badminton's World's Men's Team Championship Cup equivalent uh, to the Tennis Davis Cup is named the Thomas Cup after him. He lived most of his life in London and Godalming. Okay, so a very interesting competitive player in a more generic sense. Let's have a look at his game against Capablanca in round two of the Hastings tournament of 1934. So Capablanca playing white kicked off with d4. What does this great sportsman have to offer Capablanca on the chessboard? Knight f6, after c4 we see e6, as though there might be a Nimzo engine, but in fact we see just the solid classical d5, the Queen's Gambit declined territory. Bishop g5, and then we see knight bd7, e3, c6. So it's a Slav triangle in a Queen's Gambit declined. a3, bishop e7, queen c2, black castles, knight f3. So good so far. It looks like a fairly solid position for black. Let's put on a good bit of hair, and I'll tell you basic valuation shifts if they're at all dramatic. Yeah, for the moment white has a small nagging edge. Rook e8, rook d1 from Capablanca, knight f8, a classic maneuver actually. Trying to shield the h7, knight g6 is useful later, quite often. After bishop d3, well the h7 pawn is shielded by both knights at the moment, but uh, d takes c4, bishop takes c4, Knight d5, offering an exchange of bishops to try and simplify here. Kappa takes this, Queen takes e7. Black is still left with this problematic bishop to have to sort out. Of the castles, b6 to try and sort this bishop out. But uh, for the moment, white's advantage isn't that large. It's significant, though, technically. It's nearly half a pawn. White does enjoy an advantage. And actually the engine suggestion of knight e4 here, curiously, perhaps trying to keep a bind on the c5 advance, which black might be interested in later. But Capablanca plays actually knight e2. Where is the knight heading? What is happening here? Well, we see now bishop b7, and now e4 from white. The knight goes back to f6. And now knight g3 this is one of the favorite maneuvers of alexander anakin as well to have knights like this here on g3 and f3 we see rook ed8 rook f e1 rook a c8 so okay it's not amazing hyper modern dynamic chess it's solid classical chess so far and white enjoys still a nagging advantage kappa plays queen b3 here we see queen c7 now, what is black up to? What are the threats? They're quite difficult to perceive, actually. I think this is a little bit of a waiting move to see what white will do. If e5, that would giving up the d5 square. I don't think this is that great for white. If knight d5 
5 well maybe knight e4 is actually quite unpleasant black has to be careful even with e5 perhaps best would be retreating the knight to parry that d6 square to e8 but here Kappa played the curious queen a2 and perhaps white's advantage slips a little bit actually queen a2 might be a, a slight turning point from Capablanca. e5 is potentially given the d6 square one of the weaknesses of black's position this might have been the way to play it so e5 just to review this again knight e8 if that's really forced knight e4 this is quite pleasant for white but maybe with the c5 break black is on the verge of equality okay but this didn't occur so we saw instead this queen a2 and now black played c5 and arguably at this point black is a tiny bit better he's really sorted out this classic bad bishop problem the bishop looks quite good there and black is actually threatening c takes d4 on the bishop on c4 kappa reacts now with the move d5 and there's a really really clever tactical move in the circumstance uh, i wonder if you can guess it if i gave you 10 seconds starting from here it makes sure black is preserving his nagging edge with the black pieces against the great Capablanca. What would you play here? Okay, b5, it's a good undermining move. If it's ignored, then I think we can just play c4 here. And that starts to be quite pleasant for black. But uh, it's taken, and we see e takes d5 to the point, undermining that d5. Black's pieces look quite beautiful here. e5, and now we see knight e4. And this can lead to a very, very big problem now. After knight takes e4, this is a bit of a blunder, believe it or not, already. You might not think, how can this be a blunder here? Just the simple knight takes e4. How on earth? Can this be a blunder? Let's have a quick look before we get into it. Perhaps white could have played more cautiously with a move like queen b1, but from an engine point of view, black is actually better here. For example, knight takes g3 and then knight e6. There's a nice blockade, and these pawns look quite mobile. This bishop looks very nice. This looks like a very, very pleasant position indeed, with ideas like c4 coming up to block the bishop, make the bishop go an awkward route back. It's, it's starting to be not that pleasant for white at all. But we see Camerblanca playing knight takes e4. After d takes e4, knight d2. Do you see anything suspect tactically about white's position? Can you see what black played here to gain a big advantage against the great Camerblanca? A very big one. If I gave you 10 seconds, starting from now, you might want to pause the video. Okay, there's a loose piece here. Loose pieces with double attacks can be disastrous. And we see actually this set up. Rook takes d2, creating another loose piece. Rook takes d2, there's two loose pieces, and all we need now to celebrate loose pieces is a double attack. Can you spot it? Queen a5. Ouch. There's no way the queen can double defend this, or anything can double defend it. So white is losing material. Camper tries b4, we have queen takes b5. So b takes c5, black is material up, queen takes c5, queen b2. What can Capablanca do? The bishop moves out of the way. Rook d d1. Let's see, queen e7, queen d4. h6, giving the king some scope so the back row isn't that weak. Queen d6, this is just taken off. Rook takes d6. Now knight g6, the e5 pawn is a bit weak. Capablanca tries e6, that's just taken. Rook takes e6. King f7, the rook moves. Rook c7 protecting the pawn. Rook b1. Knight e7. 
h4 is played now so the king's got some space to move knight c8 protecting the pawn maybe freeing the rook up rook b5 bishop b7 check king g8 rook e6 capitanko is trying to coordinate the rooks into something quite dangerous maybe you can imagine with h5 and something on the back row here so some careful defense is needed knight e7 the rook moves bishop d5 trying to evict these rooks rook d6 rook c8 now rook a6 now we see check king h2 knight c6 elegantly protecting the a7 pawn black's advantage has persisted h5 rook c2 and now there's a serious threat it seems of e3 here among other things to try and target g2 if takes rook f5 bishop e6 is played this is one of the strongest moves in this position and for the moment uh black's pieces are not in trouble at all it's fine bishop uh sorry rook f4 is played now rook c4 defending that pawn and here you know it's also protected by the bishop of course so i think a move like f3 this wasn't played but f3 i think we can just just simply take this capablanca actually tried g4 we see now bishop c8 and lo and behold this rook is stranded but actually what could black do in this position black is threatening bishop c8 the rook is stranded actually on a6 how on earth did this happen is losing even more material let's just rewind just slightly what happens here after rook c2 uh, the, the rook wasn't at all threatened with this maneuver just yet it was after rook f5 that actually that's why bishop e6 is so powerful it's not just attacking the rook it's also facilitating bishop c8 and it's only the a4 square which allowed the rook to escape from this and we see again a dual purpose move not just defending the pawn but securing that a4 escape route so bishop c8 is a very powerful threat to win more material so capablanca is going even further downhill in this position when he liked it or not to bishop c8 so g4 bishop c8 and now a whole bishop up because rook takes c6 was played rook takes e4 king f7 rook a4 rook a6 defending the pawn check king e7 check king f6 and white actually resigned here he gave george the benefit of the doubt now this was a spectacular performance overall from george Allen thomas because he ended up also in the next round with another sensational result in round three of the hastings tournament george allen thomas had worked out uh worked up rather a big advantage against Mikhail botvinnik and it looked a bit scary after queen g1 from Mikhail botvinnik uh, to join in the game quite late on at move 47. but uh thomas bravely played just king f3 or rather well calculated the queen controls the f1 square Botvinnik tries bishop h4 black is suffering from potentially a weak d5 square here and white welcomed the opportunity to just get the queens off queen c5 check and with this now thomas was able to guide this position into a win a few moves later so he's taking a4 he's about to protect c5 from d3 and now in this other other later stage now he's going to generate another pass pawn the h pawn and in this position after g takes h5 Mikhail Botvinnik ends up resigning in in the end of the tournament uh, George Allen Thomas actually had to share uh, first with two others unfortunately he lost his last round otherwise it truly would have been even more sensational than it than it already was but to beat two of the world champions of chess i think is worthy of note in our evolution of style series okay i hope you enjoyed these two games and this last fragment comments or questions on youtube thanks very much